Thank you, worship team. So a couple weeks ago, uh, we had a combined service. I know we had one last week here. It was an incredible experience, by the way. I don't know if you were here last week, but that was awesome. I just loved, I got a real sense of how incredible the acoustics are in this building. Whoever built, did a fantastic job to hear the voices rise. Incredible time together. A couple weeks ago, some of you made the trip across Richmond. I know it was January 1st, so, you know, some people were kind of, you know, not looking to spend their holiday season doing that. But for those who came, you got to get a little bit of slice, a little sense of what it's like for our other church. And in case you don't know, I pastor another church across the tunnel that, that tunnel, uh, <laughs> in Richmond, we're sister churches, both part of the same denomination. But you got a sense that our buildings are very, very different, didn't you, right? Like, our building in Richmond is, you know, over 50 years old at this point, and um, it's well used, let's put it that way. It was built long ago. Um, it uh, is, though it is owned by us uh, at our church, it's actually uh, utilized by three different entities. And here's the truth about three entities trying to work together in one space. You know, like, you can bump into each other once in a while. It, it is, like, we make it work, but it's, it's complicated. So in addition to us holding a church service, and we are the ones who built the place, uh, there's, a, there's a Cantonese church that meets there as well. They have a very, very small space, and they have about 150 people who come to this very, very small space. So they're always looking for help from the other two entities to help facilitate their spaces. And, you know, I got hired to pastor this church, not to help this other church figure out some of their space issues, but it's just one of the realities of being good neighbors. You know, the other entity that's in there is there's a Christian school, right? Richmond Christian School, one of the three campuses meets there. So like Monday through Friday, there's a few hundred kids going crazy in the facility and, you know, parking lots, knots, and just what you would expect with a city school kind of environment. It, we can bump into each other, but for the most part, we make it work. But every now and then there's something that kind of comes up against what I'm trying to do that could really set me backwards. So here it is. It's actually, you know, a few months ago. So I had started this process of uh, having the privilege of being able to come here every other week. You know that if I'm not here, uh, you're getting the better half. You're getting the better preacher. You're getting my wife. She's going to be here instead. So it's one of those weeks. I don't need to hear amens. Thank you. <laughs> so my wife is here. I'm at the church in Richmond by myself. So, you know, I, I don't have, you know, the extra pastoral staff to help me on these issues. It's part of the service. After the first song, I've come up and I've started to give the announcements. The music dies down. And when the music died down, it wasn't loud, but I heard this faint noise that wasn't going away. You know what it sounded like? It, it sounded like someone's phone was going off, or maybe someone's alarm clock was going off, but it was muffled, right? Like, so I figured someone's sitting on their phone. I expect at any moment someone's going to turn it off, but they don't. It just keeps going and going and going. So I power through, pretend like it's not affecting me, pretend like it's nothing, go to sit down, expecting it to turn off, and it still doesn't. And even when the music starts, it's, it's a lot fainter, but I can still hear it. So I think it's, it's got to be in the foyer. So I head out to the foyer, right? And when I get out to the foyer, I hear it louder, but I realize it's not coming from inside our building. It's coming outside. So I think, okay, uh, someone's car alarm must be going off. And the moment I step outside, I realize it's not a car alarm. It's like a security alarm going off. And the security alarm is on the other side of the building. It's the Cantonese church because I see all of a sudden dozens of people starting to file out and they're holding their ears like this. And it's been going off probably now for about two or three minutes. Now here we are. We're we're halfway through a song. I know I've got 2.5 songs worth of time to figure out what's going to happen and how I can rectify this situation. Because if not, you know who's going to be showing up soon? The police. And if the police show up, it's going to help our attendance, but it's going to interrupt our service, right? So I go into the Cantonese service, and, and this alarm, I mean, it is blasting. It's loud. People are huddled around, you know, instruments. They're trying to figure out what's happening. And I go and I try to identify someone who's in charge. I know the pastoral leadership there, but I don't see any of them. 
So I'm looking around, and I'm calling, but no one can hear me because the noise is so loud. Finally, I'm tapping people on the shoulder, and I'm talking to them, like that, but they can't hear each other. They can't even hear me through this whole process, and so we're like identifying, signaling with our hands, trying to figure out what's going on. Where's your pastor? No pastor? Yes, I know, no, where? where? We're trying to figure out this thing. So eventually, I start working on the panel. I manage miraculously to figure out how to turn the thing off. It was incredible. Come to find out afterwards. That this just so happened to be the week that the pastors went on sabbatical. So they were gone. They had brought in a guest speaker. They had volunteers running the church. But someone accidentally unlocked a door. They weren't supposed to unlock a door. It set off an alarm that's always armed. The thing went off. No one knew how to turn it off. There was no indication. They left no numbers of people to call. It was like one of those perfect storm situations where like, if someone from the outside didn't step in, it was just going to keep going and going, and eventually the police were going to find. I was a little frustrated. You can imagine having something like that, and then you've got to come back up here and preach. It's not always <laughs> the, the easiest segue. But I remember one of the things that was so difficult about this process was just trying to communicate. Like, I'm, I'm yelling and I'm shouting, and the information is not going where it needs to. It's like I'm trying so desperate. I'll do anything. I'm here. I'm present. I will help you. I want to communicate something to you, but for some reason, because the noise is that ear-piercing loud, I can't get what I want across. I feel like this is how so many of us feel in our relationship with God, if we're being really honest. There are seasons in our life when things are normal. You take things for granted. There are other seasons in our lives when we come to God because we have a process that we can't quite figure out, or we have a need that isn't being met. It's like we have some dots that need to be connected, and the only one who can answer that is a Heavenly Father, and yet we can't make that happen. And so we come to God, and we ask questions, or we come to Him to fill a need, and we feel as though what we are getting is silence instead. And so you keep coming and coming. The Bible encourages that. Jesus told us, when you don't get answers, keep coming. Keep knocking like that persistent widow. He says, the door will be open to the one who knocks. And so we come and we come, and yet we just continually feel like we are hearing nothing back. It's like we're shouting, and there's nothing coming back. But, you know, what I've come to realize is that for some of us, this has caused us to have real angst about the nature of our faith in the first place. No wonder there's so many people who doubt no wonder there's so many people who actually abandon faith altogether. It's not that they don't have some belief system still attached to their hearts. It's just, why is God silent when I feel as though I'm shouting and I need a response from him back? But here's what I think I've come to realize. I've come to realize that maybe, just maybe, it's not God who's not listening to us. It's that we haven't learned how to listen to God's voice in our lives. Watch this. Every single day. I have two little kids. Um, we, and by we I mean my wife, tries really hard to limit their screen time, right? Because if we let them watch cartoons or play video games, they would, they would never sleep. They'd never sleep, right? They would just do that all day. So the one day we make an exception is Saturday morning. I don't know if you grew up in a house. Saturday morning was like sacred time. Before we could like stream everything, like you couldn't get me up early in the morning throughout school, but Saturday morning, I'm up at the crack of dawn. I've got my sweet Coakley cereal, and I'm watching six hours worth of cartoons. I love Saturday morning. So we let our kids get up, go watch some cartoons on Saturday morning, but eventually there comes a limit even for us. Like Rachel and I, it's wonderful. We have coffee talk. We actually get to talk uninterrupted, but after a while, we start to feel like bad parents. So we are like, okay, we, we got to get the kids off the TV. So usually this is how it will happen. I'll turn on the light, and I'll yell downstairs. Kids, time to get off the TV. What? Kids, time to get off the TV. Turn it off. What? Eli, Micah, TV off. What? And I'll say this. I could say this. Guys, no joke. I could say this 25, and you know what response? I'm 25 times. You know what I'm going to get back? What? 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 
It's not that they can't hear me. It's not even that they can't hear that I'm speaking to them. It's that their attention has been so focused on other realities that it has tuned their mind to a distraction other than the voice of the Father that is trying to draw them to a new reality. Now hear me, church. I think the reality of most of us, and I'm talking modern day, 21st century, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christians, is that we lack one thing in our lives that when we come to moments of crises, we feel as though God is not present because we have not built in a practice and a discipline into our life that is so basic and so simple and yet not practice. And it's this, the discipline of listening. Listening. If you don't learn to listen today to the voice of God in your life, and by the way, there is a remedy for this, and there is clear direction for this. We're going to get to that. But if you don't learn to listen to it today, when you need to hear from God, when you get the diagnosis that you didn't want to get, when you find that your kids are going off the rail, when you've lost someone in your life that's loved, and you need something more than just what theological textbooks can give you, you need something more than just the memory verse, you need God's voice to speak to you afresh. If you haven't built in the practice and the discipline of learning to listen to his voice today, you might miss it when you really, really need it. We've been in this new series um, that we began last week. It's called A Life Worth Living. We're looking at a book of the Bible that's, to be frank, often overlooked. Overlooked because, let's be honest, it's a downer. You ever have that person in your life that when you go up to them and you ask them, hey, how are you doing? They're always like, man, it's awful. It's kind of like Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh. It's like, nobody loves me. Like, they always have a negative spin on something. After a while, you kind of just avoid that person. Let's be honest. It's like, hey, Frank, you're going over this way. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. When I read Ecclesiastes, which is the book we're studying this month, it's kind of how I read it. Ecclesiastes is kind of a downer. It's not that there's not truth in the book. It's that it's, it's like charged truth, emotionally charged truth. It's coming from someone this unknown individual known the preacher who's lived a life full of experience and is looking backward with regret. And in his regret, he's seen that so many of the realities out there and so many things he chased was meaningless. It's like chasing the wind, pointless. You can kind of feel like, man, I need to like question my career choices and my life decisions right now when you read this book. It's kind of one of those negative books. But listen to me. If you learn to navigate through the charged emotion, there is a treasure trove of truth in there. And so one of the things we're going to look at today from this context is what it means to build in this discipline of what it looks like to listen. And the context that the preacher is going to use in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, starting at verse 1, is from the context of temple worship. What is temple worship? Well, for the ancients, it's kind of like coming to church, right? Like this is the place you went to worship. This is the place you went to seek God. But the way you would do it is very different than the context we have here today. You did it through the offerings and the sacrifices you would bring before the Lord. You would come to the temple, and you would bring produce, or you would bring finances, or you would bring livestock, something that was costly to you, something that really you don't want to give up, but you're giving it, one, to show thankfulness to God who always supplies our needs, and also to say, God, you're worthy. I trust you. It was an act of trust as much as it was an act of worship. And it's in this context that we're going to learn what the preacher has to say about this discipline known as learning. Follow along with me here in chapter 5, starting at verse 1. It says this. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near, watch this, to listen whether, rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they are wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth, do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven, and you are on earth, so let your words be few. A dream comes when there are many cares, and many words mark the speech of a fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fulfill fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. So do not let your mouth lead you into sin, and do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry 
at what you say and destroy the work of your hands. Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. In case you haven't figured it out yet, I'm an extrovert. Here's what it means to be an extrovert. People fire you up. They fuel you. Introvert, extrovert, like we all deal with people. We all have time off. It's just where you get your energy from. I get my energy from people. Like, you realize, like, this is my dream scenario. Like, you're sitting there listening to me talk to you. Like, this is like heaven for me. Like, I, I love being around people. I, Sunday morning, I always go through what I call the Sunday afternoon crash because then all of a sudden I'm back home and I'm like, oh, where's everyone? I want to talk to someone. Like, I, I love being around people. You know what the problem of being an extrovert is? The thing that is your strength, you like to connect and talk with people, is also the thing that can get you in so much trouble so often, right? You ever put your foot in your mouth? Oh, my word. People who talk more often are more likely to get their foot in their mouth, not because they're trying to do something mischievous, just because out of innocence, we say something in the heat of the moment that comes back to bite us. Sort of like the time I told my wife when we were dating, I want to marry you, and I'm hoping to do it this year. And then I came back to her six months later and said, I'm sort of rethinking that. Like, there's some things you have to learn that you, one, you, you can't take them back, and two, it's, it's good to think before you speak, right? Because if you don't, you look like a fool. If you don't, you stick your foot in your mouth. If you don't, you lose friendships and relationships and trust with people. If we are taught to learn to guard our tongue when it comes to how we interact with others, why is it that we don't do this in our conversations with God? I don't know how much you talk to God. I try to talk to God all the time. But here's what I come to find with a lot of us. A lot of us are way more flippant, way more conversational, way more relaxed in how we talk to God than we are with individuals. That's not necessarily a bad thing. If anything, Jesus talked to God in terms that were very relational. He called him Abba, Father, Daddy, Papa. This this is a deep, intimate relationship. But watch this. To have a father is to have respect for someone who brought life into you. He's to have someone who has authority over you. And sometimes we come to God and we say things to him in the heat of the moment that we have no real reason, no real idea, no real intention of fulfilling later on. And so what we do is we say vows to God. We say things like this. Have you ever done this? Hey, God, if you get me out of this mess. (laughs) God, I I didn't study for this test, but like if, if you just magically make the answers come to my mind. Yeah. Hey, hey, God, like, I'm, I'm really unhappy, and if you just give me this one thing, yeah, I'll go to church every day. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give a big financial sum of money up. I'll, I'll become a missionary to that country that nobody wants to go to, right? Like, people have actually prayed these things. My guess is that you've prayed these things because I know I have. I, I, I've said a prayer and a vow to God that I had no intention of keeping if I'd stopped and paused and really thought through the ramifications of what I'm saying. And what the Bible cautions and warns us on is that this is not just some pie-in-the-sky hopeful figure. This is the sovereign, holy, other, sacred God that you are dialoguing with. So let your words be few when you come before him. When you come before him and you bring him a promise, a quick, res- a quick to promise response, because we like to talk, is the thing that what it does is it engages the sense we want to use the most, which is our speech, but actually the Bible tells us is the polar opposite of what we should be engaging the most, which is our ears. In the Old Testament, you've got to think back a couple thousand years plus ago. There were not some of the things that wow us today. The temple would have been maybe the most magnificent structure you would have looked at in the ancient world. When you came to the temple, it was bigger than any other structure, bigger than the palace, bigger than any other construction that you've seen, bigger than any reservoir. You would come to the temple, and you were meant to look at the high ceilings, and you were meant to look at the the decorations and the paintings and the tapestry. You were meant to get a sense of holy awe when you came. You You were to come in here and go like, wow. This is so big. This represents the bigness, the, the magnitude, the majesty of God. And you came to realize that, oh, I am so small. Like, not in a bad way. Like, whew, 
He is so much bigger. You were meant to be awed when you came to the temple. What the Bible here is describing, what the preacher is describing, it's like the person who comes to the temple and doesn't even bother to look up. He's just sort of going through the motions and he hasn't prior to coming to the building engaged his heart in the action he's about to perform and because he has not engaged his heart, it's a short step to the reality that he has not engaged his heart in his relationship with God. See, when you came to the temple, you did not talk. You marveled. Isaiah, Abraham, Daniel, John, when they saw God in the scriptures, they were so overwhelmed. Do you remember these stories? They fell at the feet of the angel, or they fell at the feet of the risen Christ, as though dead. They were so overwhelmed with the magnitude, the holiness, the incredible nature of God, that they were drawn to silence. When you came to the temple, you were meant to get just a, just a slice of that reality. You did not come in and profane the sacred. You came in to meet God, and you did so in silence. See, part of the problem in our culture, in our current world today, is that there's not a whole lot that wows us anymore, right? Is this not the age of instant and constant stimulation? We're not stimulated by something in front of us all the time. We're stimulated by multiple things in front of us all the time. You know what the attention span of a kid is today? We're talking in the seconds. We multitask. How many of you are on social media while you're watching TV, while you're eating, right? Like, like we, we, don't, we, don't pot, we don't carve out things, do we, anymore? We, we are just constantly junk seekers. We are junkies for the different kinds of stimulations that are in our head all the time. Let me ask you this, and actually let me challenge some of you to this. Why don't some of you later on today go and look at yesterday's search history on your computers to see, watch this, the amount of individual websites you clicked on in one 24-hour cycle. You will be blown away by the hundreds, and for some people, thousands of sites you clicked on because we are so used to stimulation, 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 stimulation. No wonder you can't hear from God because you have so much white noise constantly drowning out the most important voices that are to draw you to truth, reality, and the way you should go from this point forward. It is a hard discipline. You know, the hard discipline of listening is first realizing I need to turn off. I need to silence. I need to stop. What God is saying here in this text through the preacher's words is that what we need to do before we ever engage with hearing from the voice of God is we need undivided, church hear me, not partially divided, undivided attention before God. If not, your life will be in wreck. I got in a car accident five months ago. And it was all my fault. I was going to Tim Hortons in Tawasson, the one Tim Hortons in the lower mainland that doesn't have a drive through And I was in a hurry because I was coaching a baseball game with my son, and we were running late. And I hadn't eaten that day, and I needed something in my stomach, and I needed a coffee to wake me up before I had a bunch of nine-year-olds running around, right? So I think I'm going to chance it. I'm going to pull in, I'm going to run into that Tim Hortons. I should have known better because it's always the same case when I go in there. There was a lineup of like four people in front of me, which meant I waited for 12 minutes before I decided this is not worth it, I'm going to be late, and I left. When I left, I was in a huff. I was angry, I was upset, I was frustrated, I was distracted. Because I didn't even get my order. I just wasted time on waiting for a sandwich or a donut that's already right there in front of me. So I get in the Jeep and I pull out. I'm not on my phone. I'm not like punching in the GPS. My concentration here was just not focused on the task at hand, which was safety. I had my son in the back and everything. I just needed to get to the ball fields, which was right across the street. And you ever have those situations where you come up to a light and like you're just not, you're not focused. You're not paying attention. It's like last second you hit the brakes. Well, I forgot that last part. And so I just drive right through the red light. 
Like, like it was my, like I'm the king and the highway's all mine. And I came and someone T-boned me. I remember the police and the fire station came. They said, sir, what happened? I said, I don't know. I, I, like they were like, well, were you texting? Were you on the phone? No, no, listen, it's 100% my fault. I just was somewhere else. My mind was divided on so many different issues. I think we live life like this. Any parents here? Oh my goodness. I feel like my life is 50% pastor, 50% Uber driver. Like I'm just taking my kids from one activity to the next. I'm distracted, I'm overworked, I'm overthinking things. And sometimes when I'm divided like this, I can't concentrate on the one thing that's right in front of me that's the most important thing. What God requires of us in the discipline of learning to hear from him is an undivided heart. One of the most important pieces of scripture you'll ever hear, it's the most important passage of uh, scripture for Jews. Judaism says, like, our John 3.16 is their Deuteronomy 6. It's a passage called the Shema. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our Lord God, is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Jesus would do this later on when he teaches from the Sermon on the Mount. You know what he's saying here? First thing he's saying is, the God that you're serving, he's an undivided God. He's not like the other gods, plural, of the other cultures around us. He is one. He's an undivided God. And then the second thing is, is when we come to him, we are meant to come to him with our own sense of, undiv- we don't have compartmentalized faith. It's an undivided devotion before him. To love the Lord with all your heart, soul, strength, as Jesus says, mind, is to engage all of your energies focused, undivided on him alone. But how do you do this? It's the very first word. Hear. Hear. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is one. The average person can hold their breath underwater for about 30 to 90 seconds. Every now and then I have these little contests with my kids to see who can go under the water the longest when we're in the swimming pool. I'm not sure that's the healthiest thing to be doing with my kids. Um, I can do it for a couple minutes, three, maybe three minutes. Like I, the more I do it, the more I practice it, the better I get at it. Do you know that Navy SEALs, when they train, have to be able to hold their breath for at least five minutes, five minutes underwater. That's intense. You know what the world record is? 24 plus minutes. One person underwater survived, came up, normal functions thereafter. How do you go from 30 seconds to 24 minutes? You have to have such an undivided focus on training yourself every single day to get a millisecond better and a millisecond better, and a millisecond better to be able to break a world record like that. We just feel, and sometimes I think the church has been guilty of this. We've taught and trained that all you got to do is come to Jesus. All you got to do is say a prayer. All you got to do is just come to church. All you got to do is volunteer. All you got to do is get, but you know what? Following Jesus is the single most important decision of your life, and what Jesus says is it's a costly decision. It's not something to be taken lightly. And in part of what that looks like is that for you and I, we need to almost train ourselves every single day to listen to his voice. So I'm going to tell you how do you do that. This is how you hear. This is how we're ending our service today. To hear is to receive. This is the word of God. I'm not saying that God can't speak to your heart in unique ways as long as it lines up with this book. This is the context with which our faith comes through. But here's what I've come to realize. The average Christian home has two Bibles in their house. We don't read either of them. What would it look like if every single day, I don't feel like it, doesn't matter, I'm training. Ah, I got so many things, doesn't matter, I'm disciplined. I'm going to start receiving the word of God into my life. I'm not going through anything. doesn't matter. Build the discipline now. Pastor Chris, I, I, I don't even know where to start. Start with the book of Mark. Action-packed, short, all about Jesus. Love it. 
why don't you spend, if, if you're saying like, I can maybe get five minutes of the Bible before my, before my mind goes, five minutes, start there. But do it every day. Some people are morning people. I'm not. I'm a night person, but I read my Bible every single night to receive. Because I know there's going to come a point in my year, in my life, in my context, where that discipline is going to pay off massively. Because when I'm questioning, when the enemy attacks my heart and my head, I can instantly reflect on what God said over and over again. You ever read the Bible sometimes? It's like, I've read that text 50 times. But for some reason, it's speaking to me in a new way. That's because this ancient document is the, watch this, living word of God. Jesus Christ in John 1 is called the word become flesh. This is more than just a text. There is something deeply intimate and spiritual when you receive from this text every single day. So if you're here saying, you know, kind of like New Year's resolutions, I don't have a lot of training in this field. Start with five minutes a day. Maybe you want a devotional, whatever. But engage. Discipline your heart, your actions, your motivations, because one day this word of God will come to light in your way, life in a way that is so desperately meaningful and needing for you in your context when you come to situations where you have to hear from God instead of looking to him in desperation. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. And we want to thank you that you are a God that hears. <laughs> There's so many beads over here that just reflect that you still listen to our prayers. You still hear us. And you're wanting to teach us and you're wanting to speak to us. May we reflect that people gave their lives to give us this book. There are countries around the world today where to own just a mere piece of paper from this book will cost them imprisonment, maybe even their life. How important this book is that sometimes we neglect. And so for those of us who maybe read this book already every single day, we pray that you would train us to take that next step of discipline to receive even more. That as we discipline and train ourselves to take in five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 30 minutes a day, that what is produced in our life is not just knowledge, but a hunger to know you. Because nothing can be more worthy, nothing is greater than encountering the living God like Abraham, or Moses, or David, or Isaiah, or John. We want that experience. We want to see you high and lifted up. We want to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, and who is to come. We, at the deepest core of ourselves, want to experience the living God. Would you be faithful as you have for 2,000 years to disciples who have dug into this book to meet us where we're at and communicate to us life as we learn to discipline our hearts and our ears to listen solely undivided to you. We put this before you, and we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen.